So if we were to execute it now, this will create the chat. So what we can do in the users is we can fire off a query to get the chats. This one is going to fail. The reason it fails is because the chats property doesn't return an array of chat objects. It returns an array of IDs. So if you were to look at the user model, this one has a chats property, but this is an array of object IDs. So it sounds like we need to go back to the user resolver and we need to specify a custom resolution logic for the chats of the user. I'm going to put in the key referring to the user and we're going to specify chats on it. Once again, it's a regular resolver with the exception that the root object in this case is going to be the actual user model. We'll have the args, context if we need to, the info. And what we need to do is we need to somehow resolve the chats property. So what we can do is we can use the populate method. We can specify the chats property and we're going to call it on the user object. So what this will do is this will populate the user with the chat object. So if before the user was an object with chats, where the chats was an array of IDs, like let's say one, two, three, after you call the populate method, this will populate the array with the actual chat objects. So what we need to do is we need to call await on it. And because of the promises syntax, we also need to call exec populate after the populate method. So finally, we're going to need to also add the async keyword. And now after we've done that, we can return user.chats or otherwise what we can also do is we can have a return statement on the same line. We can wrap the await with parentheses and because it's going to return the newly updated or newly populated user object, we can just simply write dot chats on it like that. So let's go back to the browser. If we run the same query again, this time it's going to work and it's going to give us all the chats. But not everything is going to work yet because if we tried, let's say, messages, this will fail once again because we don't have the messages property on the chat. Once again, it's the same exact scenario as with the user, except in this case, we don't have the messages property at all. So what we can do is we can go back to chat. We can create a new chat key. We can create a messages resolver. So we're going to resolve the chat. We can have any args, context, and info if we need to. And now because every message is going to have a chat ID property on it, what we can do is we can simply have a message dot find, and we're going to find all the messages such that the chat property equals chat dot ID. And we can return that. And once again, if you look at the message model, the chat property, once again, it's going to refer back to the chat. So now if we try it again, this will at least give us an empty array. But if you went further, so let's say you tried to get the users for a given chat, once again, this is going to fail. Same exact thing because the users property on the chat in the database or in MongoDB actually contains an array of object IDs. But for GraphQL, we need to return an array of actual objects or actual models. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna return back, we're gonna call an await on chat.populate. So we're gonna populate the users. And once again, this will be an arrow function with an async keyword. So once we populate it, let's do exact populate and we're going to return the users out of it. And this of course is users, not user. So if we try to run it again, so now we get the chats with the users inside of them. And finally, we don't have the last message yet, but if we were to, the call would also fail in this time because last message is an object ID once again. So we can define last message on the chat and this will be an async function. We're going to populate the last message and we'll return the last message. So now if we run it, of course, we won't get any results yet, but at least we're going to know that in the long run, this should work. And of course, as far as the messages go, we also need to do pagination in here because right now we are returning all messages, but in fact, there could be millions of them. So we need to paginate them and we could also work on projection here as well. In fact, projection applies to just about any resolver in this file or even in this project. And now since we added a custom object ID validator, what we can do is we can go back to the user resolver and we can actually get rid of this condition to validate the object ID. What we can do instead is we can use joy for this purpose. So we can call a joy.validate. We'll pass in the args and we'll pass in the schema. In this case, we can call it object ID. So we need to get access to the args object. So in here we'll do args.id and we're going to do an await on this. That's why we need to add the async keyword. So now we can get rid of mongoose and also user input error. So for the object ID, it's possible that this type of validation is going to happen in other places as well. So we're going to make the object ID generic. So let's go back to schemas. I'll create a new file. It's called utils 
Node.js. So in here, we're going to import joy from joy. In this case, we need to import it from the same directory because we need to get access to the object ID custom validator that we've created. So let's export a const of object ID. So this will be joy.object and it's going to have a single key of ID. So this will be joy.string.object ID and the label we can give it object ID like this. So with that, if we go back to index, we need to export everything from utils. And now we should be able to import it from schemas. So now let's go back to the browser. I'm going to try to do a query on user. So let's pass in an empty string. This will fail. The object ID is not allowed to be empty. If I pass in gibberish, this will fail again because this must be a valid object ID. Now if I pass in the ID of this first user, this will succeed and that would be myself. Now if I change the ID to something that's not existent in the database, I'll get user of null. And that makes sense because the user with that ID doesn't exist. All right, so the last thing I'll do is let's switch back to our second user. We'll do a me query on chats. So let's get all the chats by ID. Let's get all the messages, maybe also last message. And it looks like it worked. And the only issue that we didn't tackle is the title. So what happened right there is that we've created a chat that doesn't have a title. And because we specified the title as a required property, we cannot return null for that chat field. So I think what we could do for the title is we could generate the title based on the names of the users. So for instance, if you pass a valid title, that title will be supplied to the chat when the chat is being created. But if the title was not supplied, what we could do is for the chat, we can assign that title to a string that contains the names of the users. So let's say, for example, if I'm Alex, this will be Alex. The second user in this case is Max, so they'll be like comma, Max. And if we had more users, we could also add them. And lastly, if we had, let's say, 50 different users, we could just simply display, let's say, five. So for example, Alex, Max, Ray, Jim, and Kyle, and leave off the string with an ellipsis to indicate that there's actually more users, because especially in the UI, it will be difficult to display a full list of users. So this is something that we could do for the title. And of course, we could put all of that logic to add the names of all the users in this file, but it makes sense to extract out something like this to the model. So let's actually take it out. Let's save the file for the time being. And I'm going to close off everything else. Let's open the chat model. So what we could do is just like we did inside of the user model where we added the pre-save hook, we could do the exact same thing for the chat model. In fact, let me copy it. So I'll bring it back in here. So on the chat schema, we're going to define a pre-save hook and this one will fire when creating a chat. So if I were to go back to the solvers, we have the create call. This call will trigger the pre-save hook. So what we're going to do is we're going to check if this chat has a title and if it doesn't, we're going to have to assign it ourselves. So in the end, what we need to do is we need to do this dot title, assign it to something. So what we could do is we can get hold of the user model. So we could do user dot where ID is inside of the range of this dot users. Once again, in the resolvers, the users property is going to be the list of all the user IDs. So we're going to find all the users that belong to that users array. And we'll just import user from the current directory. We're going to set a limit because as I said before, we want to shorten the title if there's too many users. For example, we can shorten the title after five users or five names. So let's create a constant user limit. We can set it to five. So we're going to fetch as many as five users and we're going to select the name of each user. So we're going to do const users. Let's do an await on it. So now to get the names of the users, we could do names. This will be users.map. So we can take out the name of each user and we can basically join them with a comma. So now we can say if this.users.length exceeds the limit, so the user limit that we've defined. So if there's more than five participants in a chat, we're going to need to modify the names. So let's actually make this a mutable variable. So we're going to use let instead of const and we're going to say names. Let's actually rename it to title because we're going to be setting the title for the chat. So if we reach the limit, we're going to simply add the ellipsis to the end of that title string and we're going to assign it to this dot title. So let's see if this worked. What I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the two users. So I'm going to delete the chats reference for both of them. All right. And now we can also delete the chats collection. I've already done that. 
But back in here, let's see if we could do a query on myself with the chat, with ID, users, also messages, if there's any. So now we don't get any chats and that's expected. So if we were to write out a mutation, let's start a chat. I'm gonna grab the ID of the second user, which is Max. So I'll fill out the user IDs. So let's get ID and title. And I'm gonna save this to the queries file just so we can reuse it afterwards. And let's do the same thing for this user's query. In fact, I'll add a last message as well. All right, so if we run it, this will create the new chat. And as you can see, it filled out the title as well. So now if we run the same user's query, we're gonna get the users with the chats. So as you can see, if I switch back to me, just for simplicity, we're gonna get back myself. So we're gonna get my ID and we're gonna get the list of chats. In this case, it's an array that contains a single chat. So it has an ID of that, also has a list of users. So in this case, we're not getting a list of object IDs because in fact, now I can actually get the names of those users. We also get the messages property, but for now it's empty and we get the last message, which is null for now, but that's expected. Later on, we're gonna also work on the circular issue because right now on the users sub selection, we could do a chats query. We can get the ID of all the chats, but it could also get the users of all the chats. And we can also get the chats of those users. So you could see that we can go in as many levels as we want. So there's actually ways to mitigate that, but we're gonna look into that later. And for the time being, we're gonna leave it off like that. So this is basically it for chats. And the next one, we're gonna work on messages. So I'll see you then.